Hi, y'all. I'm Robert Largent. Um, I used to work for the Cherokee Nation forever. So I've done this presentation a few times. Um, when you're out there as an inspector or if you're running your own sites, the first thing you're going to ask is, do you have cathodic protection? And probably about 95% of the time, they're going to say no. And you're done. That's pretty easy. Um, for the most part, there's not a lot of sites out there that still have cathodic protection. I don't know if, uh, Tony, you run into very many that still have it? There's a few. Do you still have some at your sites? Yeah. So we still have cathodic protection out there, so we still have to be concerned about it. But any new sites built since 2015 don't have it. So you don't have to worry about it. When you look at the 40 CFR 280, you, you'll find that there's several regulations about cathodic protection. And it starts off in 1988. It starts off telling you from new tanks, and when they talk about new tanks, they're talking about new tanks in 1988 up to 2015, basically. Um, and for the most part, after 2000, 2005, you didn't have cathodic protection on, on any of these tanks. Unless, there's some caveats to that, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, still tank for piping, you know. The first thing you want to do is make sure your equipment is not going to melt. And melt, I mean, rust away. So we're just going to kind of glance through these regulations. You guys can look them up anytime you want, because, you know. The 40 CIF R280 is out there, anybody can look it up. But I wanted you to have them on the slides so when you guys get these slides, you'll have all these regulations at your fingertips. Uh, any buried metal tank and piping. So, for the most part, if it contains fuel and it's in contact with soil, it has to be cathodically protected. And by cathodically protected, um, we'll talk about that in a little bit, how you can keep them from rusting in the ground. One of the ways they could do cathodic protection was line tanks. And we're not going to talk a lot about line tanks because for the most part, a line tank was a tank that was in the ground, a steel tank, and they added an internal lining to it. And a lot of those over the years have failed. They had to be inspected after 10 years and then every five years after that. And the more and more that they're being inspected, the, the fewer of them there are out there because they fail the, te the inspections. Brad, do you guys still see a lot of line tanks? We don't do many inspections anymore because, like you said, most of them do you have any camera videos of them? Oh, yeah. So if you guys don't know, Brad has a, a, his website has the Tuesday Tank Trouble, and they have some good videos of inside the tanks that are really interesting. They're cool to see. So if you have existing tanks or piping before, um, before 1988, which we're not going to talk a lot about those because they're so old, um, you had to make sure they're cathodically protected. You have to make sure they meet the new USD requirements. Uh, any steel tank has to be internally lined. Metal tank and pipe are cathodically protected. Then you have to look at your operation and your maintenance. Um, CP system has to be performing adequately. and has to be tested to make sure it's performing adequately. Uh, it has to be tested within six months of install. Normally what they'll do is if they install a cathodic protection system, they'll do the test like five minutes after they install it and they'll call it six months. And then every three years after that. An impressed cathodic protection system, we'll talk a little bit about, more about that later, but it's, it's a lot more involved than just a, a galvanic. You have to make sure they're tested within six months and then they're properly operated and tested. You, for the operator and the inspector, first thing you're going to be looking at is the records. The record keeping for cathodic protection uh, has to have results of the last three inspections and results of testing for the last two inspections. Now we're going to talk a little bit about corrosion. Most of you guys are familiar with corrosion, metal rust, and that's basically what corrosion is. So if you have two different types of, um, if you have a metal in the ground and an electrolyte or the soil around it, it'll cause it to rust. So when you get into the technical parts of it, you talk about the electrons leaving the metal and then going into the environment. This is supposed to be just an overview, so I'm trying not to get too in depth with some of this, but. I wanted you to have it in case you needed to try to explain cathodic protection to anybody, because it's a little, it's probably the most technical part of an underground storage tank system. There's a lot of training that goes into doing the testing for these types of systems, and a lot of certifications that you have to get. If you can stop the electrons from leaving the metal, then you pretty much have stopped the rust. And that's the goal. 
And cathodic protection is used in a lot of different ways. Um, it's used in pipelines for oil transfers. You'll see cathodic protection used on bridges, especially over ocean water. Used on ships, um, you have cathodic protection in your water heater at your house. So all these things are cathodically protected to keep from rusting. And this is just a graph of how the metals work, react to each other. Um, the higher up it is, the more anodic it is, and the lower it is, the more cathodic it is. So of course you want as much gold as you can get. <laughs> um, these are just the components that make up a corrosion cell. The anode, cathode, your metallic path, and your electrolyte. Um, electrolyte is normally the soil, but it's also the water can be considered an electrolyte. So it's just a matter of time. Most metal is going to rust over time. It's scientific certainty, and then the rate of the corrosion is probably going to be what you're more, most concerned about. And there's a lot of classes on cathodic protection, and there's a lot of uh, training involved with it. So I've only got the base level of training, so I can do the testing. But as you can see, these are the things that come from cathodic from corrosion. Microbes? Huh? Microbes? No, this is before microbes were a problem. <laughs> <laughs> this, oh, is yeah. a, this is the external of the tanks where they've rusted away and. You, every portion of the USD system that contains product and can corrode needs to be cathodically protected. Some measures, the methods of corrosion control, um, of course, the first thing is to build your stuff out of equipment that won't corrode. That includes, you know, fiberglass, clad steel, stainless steel piping supposedly kind of won't corrode, but... Bye. Yeah. <laughs> Um, or you can use a sacrificial or a galvanic anode. Those two terms are used interchangeably. They don't require any external power sources to operate. And then an impress current, which requires an external power source to operate. And of course, internal lining, which hopefully we don't have very many of those left. So for instance, if you have a, like one of these two tanks out here, if you have a tank designed from that type of equipment, it should never rust. It should never. These tanks were some of the older tanks that were used. The, the one on the left is called a STIP-3 or STI-3 tank. It was protected from corrosion through three different methods. You had outer coatings that were supposed to not rust. You had bushings because you had metal components going into the tank and if those metal components started rusting, it would actually start your tank to rust too. So you had to protect those tanks from those metal components. And then sacrificial animals. The problem with installing these tanks they're great tanks and everything, but if you install a tank like this, some, some jurisdictions will require you to do three year testing on it for cathodic protection. So you create more maintenance problems for yourself if you use these tanks. They're not used a lot anymore. And then a lot of the tanks when they were installed back in the day and weren't installed correctly, they wouldn't unwrap these. They would be wrapped in plastic and they would just put them in the ground still wrapped in plastic. So they're not doing anything. There's still a lot of those out there. We, we were, I had a customer who did an acquisition of 76 sites. You know, these five or more sites that had a Stipe 3. The other downside is if you see on that picture on the left on a Stipe 3, that's where your interstitial sensor goes. And so it's actually sitting at that 45 or 90 degree elbow. So it's not even actually on the bottom of the tank. So that's, that's old technology. Yeah, anybody who wants to speak up, just jump at it. I'm pretty <laughs> <laughs> Well, right, and, and the other thing, you know, like like Robert was alluding to, the installation. I don't know how many of you have ever seen a tank installed, but you're using big equipment and heavy equipment, and one little scratch in the exterior coating is going to invalidate any of that protection. Yeah, if they put a scratch in, it's called a holiday. Right. And that's where it'll rust the quickest, because now, you've got a focal point for all the rust to accumulate. The others on the other side, they're called ACT 100, and that's basically what your modern welding tanks are. The tanks we're gonna to see tomorrow. Uh, Thursday. Thursday. Tomorrow's the day after Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the early ACT 100s also had anodes, but you don't see those very often anymore. Um, so if your still service is isolated from, isolated from electrolytes, this shouldn't rust. Of course, if it rushed on the inside, you know, that's another story. This is just a graphic of what it looks like when you have um, 
some of your anodes and your cathodes. These are some things that are for, if they're in the ground, if you have other metal components in the ground, sometimes that can actually accelerate the rusting of metal components of your tank. So say you have metal piping going nearby that's not cathodically protected, or even a metal fence around the area. That can actually exasperate the corrosion from a tank like this. This is what an impress current looks like. It's all hooked up to wires and cables, and the anodes are in the ground, and you have a meter up above ground that, whoops, no, this isn't even, a, I got off. This is just testing your galvanic. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at the next one already. There it is. So, I got my diagrams mixed up. This is what you do to test their uh, galvanic systems. You put your probes in the ground, and you just test off of the metal, and you test the reading on your voltmeter, see what it reads. And this is the one with the rectifier. Now, the rectifier has power to it all the time. You've got, again, you've got anodes in the ground, and it's hooked up to test meters and the rectifier. And the problems with these is, well, nobody's from Oklahoma, right? So I can tell in the Oklahoma tribes. So the Tonkawa, they have one of the only impressed current systems I've seen. And we, they closed the store down because they couldn't afford gas. And so we went there and they had all the power turned off to the store. So if you turn off all the power to the store, there's no power to the rectifier. So it's not working. So you're out of compliance. So we had to explain to them, you've got to keep the power on to the rectifier because you're, you're going to get a violation if you don't keep the power on. The next time we go, they got the power on to the rectifier. We're standing there looking at it. There's a guy outside weed eating. And every time he weed eats, you can hear him go by, the power goes off. So there's a loose wire, or he's hitting the wires or something. We're like, tell him to stop doing that. I don't know what's going on. But you can see the needle just go blink, blink. And it's like, I don't think it's a violation, but you wouldn't want that to happen with an inspector there, because they're going to start asking a thousand questions. And so these are some of the test methods used. Uh, most commonly, what you'll see is the negative 850. And that's what you'll be looking for on paperwork most of the time. If they have that negative 850 reading, because that means it's meeting the requirements for cathodic protection. This is what a 60 day impressed current um, list looks like. This is the one from the EPA. It's what their usual checklist looks like. This is what you see in the field. Nobody's gonna laugh. Ha <laughs> ha. <laughs> well, if you want religion to protect your tanks, you can. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I thought it was funny. <laughs> I'm just glad they didn't have 666 written all over down there. <laughs> um, so pretty much, cathodic protection is not applicable on any system built since 2015. Uh, even earlier in some states, they quit allow allowing you to put cathodic protection on tanks because they want it all to be double walled, all made of fiberglass or, or cathodically protected. What I see, we still have one site in New Mexico that has cathodic protection and impressed current. They still have steel pipes even, so it's like one of a kind that hopefully nobody else has. But what I see most often is we have a site in Oklahoma right now that can't keep water out of the sumps. Well, since the site was built before 2015, the regulations in Oklahoma allow us to keep it doesn't matter if the sumps have water or not, as long as you put cathodic protection on the STP in the sump. So that's what we still see occasionally at some of our sites. And it's just, it's not the best way to operate. I mean, you want to keep water out of your sumps, especially if you have a sump, a containment area for your sumps, and you want to keep a sensor in there, but it's a workaround or a cheat kind of to keep open and not have to keep the water out of sumps. So if you guys want to get certified for your cathodic protection, this is what I had to go through to get the NACE certifications for um, the NACE CP tester. You had to go to a seven day course. The course classes lasted about 10 hours a day. And the final was half a day was written, half a day was hands on. And they say about 60% of the people fail that test. I passed it. Did you take it? I did. Uh, it's intense. And the bad part about it. The bad part about it is they talk mostly about underground piping for oil industry. My class, they probably covered four hours of underground storage tanks. 
Not, Vicky, do they cover more than that in yours? Four hours? Maybe. They cover more than four hours? Uh, I don't know, but it was hard and it was not what I, if I had to do it over again, I would probably take the STI class, the three day course. Um, this is all about all of it that you got to do. And this is the STI, they have cathodic protection training now. Theirs is only, I think, three days long. And it's focused on gas station type equipment or tanks. So it'd probably be, as an inspector, it'd probably be more beneficial for you to take this than the NACE course. Um, here's some re resources for you. you can, these are all hyperlinks. You can go to them and they'll take you to different instructional things when you guys get these presentations. And also, there will be a cathodic protection training. Anybody familiar with Nui Pick? And they're having a cathodic protection training <laughs> August 1st, so it's coming up pretty soon. It'll be a webinar online, so you can uh, get onto it. You can listen to it. It's 1 to 3 o'clock Central or East, Eastern, I don't remember, but it's usually right at my lunchtime, so I have to eat at my desk and watch them at the same time. It'll probably be a lot more informal. These trainings from New Pick are usually a little bit more advanced. So if you want to know more, this is a good resource for you. Anybody have any CP questions? <coughs> good, because I didn't want to answer. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to go straight into walkthrough inspections, and I hope that lasted long enough.